really enjoyed the industry, but I kind of didn't feel very passionate about it. And uh, I don't know if you guys read Four Hour Work Week, but oh. Oh. never heard of it. Never fucking heard of it. I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. Prestige Living Podcast. So with that, who do you want to be? Hello, welcome to Prestige Living, Orange County's audio podcast showcasing innovative thought leaders right here in the community. I'm your host, Jay O'Brien, here with your co-hosts, Jordan Wilson. Good morning. And Kane German. One of the us. In the past, we've had uh, business owners in the fitness realm, actually a couple, and also food industry, but separately usually. So now, today our guest is a blend between the two. CEO and founder Peter Spinoza created Rise Bar back in 2011, a 20 gram protein bar with only three ingredients. Not only that, not only is it 20 grams of protein with only three ingredients, but it's non-GMO, soy, peanut, and gluten-free, while never using artificial sugars, preservatives or sugar alcohols. Most of that stuff, I have no idea what that means, so I want to figure that out. <laughs> um, and with so many different products on the market, we're excited to see what he has to say today. So without further ado, I give you Peter Spinoza. Pete, welcome to the show. Thank Dude, you. Dude, welcome, yeah, thanks bro. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Do you prefer Peter or Pete? Uh, you know, the only people who call me Peter are kind of parents and uh, close friends, but I, I love Ooh. Pete primarily. So Peter it is. I've been calling him Peter this entire time. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. So um, before we get into the Rise Bar stuff, did you? is this the first business that you've owned? This would be the first foray, yep. Okay, so what were you doing before Rise Bar? Uh, that's kind of the impetus of the story. I was actually selling medical devices, uh, worked in spine, and really enjoyed the industry, but I kind of didn't feel very passionate about it. And uh, I don't know if you guys read 4-Hour Work Week, but... Oh! No, no, no. Never heard of it. Never fucking heard of it. <laughs> Tim Ferriss is my guy. That's, that's kind of what I call one of my earthquake books, one that kind of shook me to its core. And I'll never forget, I was on a flight home from Washington, D.C. This was back in uh, September of 2009. Buddy of mine who'd been traveling the world, looked 10 years younger, gave it to me and just said, you got to check this out. And I finished it in an entire city on basically a five hour flight from DC, uh, came home, did a lot of thinking and a month later quit my job and said, I have to find my own venture of some sort where I can kind of start it, own it, um, operate it from anywhere in the world. And that was kind of the impetus that led me on a whole journey of about a year, just discovering different business opportunities, um, whether it's startup, early stage acquisition, something where I could really feel full ownership of it and be able to operate it. What were some of the sacrifices that you had to make during that discovery period? Because did you have money saved up after you quit your job or did you have to like, you know, move back home or, or sell your car or do anything like that? Yeah, no, I, I was I was home for a little over a year, but I also kind of took Tim's advice in the book and I took about six months to just travel and explore went to uh, you know, places like Brazil and uh, all over Europe, South America, just to kind of clear my head. Um, ever since I realized ever since I was a little kid, I was just grinding away um, high school, college, grad school, and this is kind of my first time to take a, a deep breath. How old were you at that point? I was 27 years old. And that was 2009? Yep. Okay. So uh, real quick, the, the travel part of it, that was more of like to unplug and reset. Um, now for your for your business since it's running more or less passively or the income is sort of passive, you can operate the business from anywhere like the four hour work week says, are you taking advantage of that? Are you, do you find yourself anchored here or are you actually traveling a lot and still running Rise Bar? Yeah, I mean, fantastic question. I, I struggle with this because I, I kind of, I always view my business as a baby. And a lot of times it's quite frankly, you know, for I'm sure all of us, it can be a sick baby and you feel guilty if you leave or take the time off. Holy shit, that's and a so good for, analogy. <laughs> and so yeah. for me, it's, you know, I realize that I have to be at my best. I don't know if you guys have read The Powerful Engagement, but another incredible book that I read recently and um, basically managing your, kind of your four different levels of energy, emotional, spiritual, physical, mental. And another kind of earthquake book for me where I realized I was spending so much time kind of on the mental component on my business that I wasn't doing anything like emotionally or kind of that, that physical release, so to speak. And so that's one of my goals this year is to take six weeks off. Dude, so to, to touch on that, when you were traveling the six months, did it feel weird for you to not work and completely try to like, like, like he said, unplug and reset, not work, not have any income? Like, did you hit any parts of like downward spirals dark parts and anxiety and then the, the I, full-blown bliss where you're like this is not as bad as it seems or as i made it out to be i mean you, you guys all seem like very type a driven individuals like i am i, I don't know if i could relax on a beach for three months i don't even know if i could do it for a month um I'm, I'm just wired to kind of 
keep grinding away. And so I think right now I'm trying to find that balance. Um, for those six months off, I, I, I would kind of go somewhere for a month and then come back for a month and think about more ideas for the business. Go somewhere for a month and have fun, come back. Mm. So it's kind of like a back and forth because I'm just, I'm not the kind of dude that can just relax for six months straight. Do you find that process to be even more beneficial than to grind for six months straight? I, I kind of view life as a, it, it's a sprint. It's a series of sprints. I like to kind of be able to go all out at like 90 to 95% and then recharge, recover, as opposed to just like continual marathon. That's um, like I, the four-hour work week, like little mini vacations. I, I love having like quarterly. I love having semi retirements. That's what I meant, mini yeah. retirements. What were your first ideas? You, you said you were working on ideas for the business. Was a, a nutrition bar the first idea, or what was your first few business ideas? Uh, a really good buddy of mine um, had this idea for. It's called a search fund, and basically, um, if you're not going to kind of start a company from scratch, can you put a little bit of money together from other kind of mentors, successful people that you know, friends and family? to maybe like acquire like a startup business opportunity or maybe there's some young guys they are struggling they kind of need a little guidance some capital and uh, that's kind of what what uh, prompted me to kind of look at different industries different niches and this is i mean i've got some good stories there because i looked at different types of businesses all across the spectrum probably about 150 different businesses over the course of a year um some of them were just completely flailing we're gonna uh, flat out fail uh, no, other businesses were thriving and they were a little bit out of my range and then sometimes I just I couldn't see eye to eye with the guys and then I did have a few different startup ideas but nothing really seemed to gain traction until another friend of mine introduced me to a company that was based out of San Diego and a really small little kind of like granola company and um, these guys were essentially kind of going out of business and it, they had a few really good bars what you can see now are breakfast bars so I, I kind of put a little money together and, and, and bought these guys, um, just kind of a really on the cheap acquisition, but I fell in love with kind of the product, these these whole uh, chunks of fruit and nut bars, tested, uh, test marketed all my friends, and that's kind of what led to me uh, going with Rise Bar and going through like this whole rebranding phase, the packaging, the names, the types of ingredients that we use, but the, the kind of the, the ethos of the brand is just these really whole ingredients, minimal ingredients is always existed. How did that name come around? Uh, we brainstormed about, gosh, well over 100 names. You know, what originally was called Boomy Bar and it was called Prana Bar. There were kind of these two little different, um, basically granola. When you bought bars. it, that's what it was called? Yeah, it was, okay. called, uh, yeah, it was called Boomy Bar. And um, I, I usually don't tell that part of the story because at the time, like when we went to, to the initial facility, it was just, I mean, it was really run down. Um, they used to make a lot of the food there and it was just like, I hate saying this on the air, but like, like cockroaches and just like grease and just nasty equipment. Um, but they made these incredible little bars. And so for us, we thought, what, what is a good name to kind of signify the, the, the changes that we're trying to make with this brand? And we thought kind of rise, like rise from the ashes, rise up, kind of a, a lot of different ways you could kind of uh, skew the brand name and different types of marketing campaigns we saw. And so for us, like kind of this we rise together community aspect, um, that's how you know I, I settled on the name. And I had a couple people on the team at the time that were really instrumental in that as so well. So did you acquire their team? Um if you guys want to go this route, I'm happy to go. It's uh, it's because this is all about like culture and management, and it's actually yeah, a good, good topic to talk about. Sure. Um, at the time, there were about um, eight people at the company, and I kind of saw within the first six months, like, wow, I, I just don't know if any of these guys have the work ethic to really get us to the next level. Um, uh, at the time, there was just not a whole lot of uh, operational flow. Um, th them trying to kind of time the different like ingredients, the batches. I mean, I'm like very much an efficiency type of guy. I think big picture marketing as well. And I just realized they were just thinking so small. And it was kind of, it was this lifestyle business for these guys. But it was a lifestyle that was like kind of destined to fail. And so I figured like, how can I still infuse my passion and energy without wearing a lot of these guys out? Um, but eventually, I, you know, one by one, um, we kind of had to part ways with all eight of those people. <clears throat> And so when you say we were thinking of the name, we, 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 do you have a partner? I, I don't have a partner. I, I say we because, uh, you know, my, my father's been like just a huge figure in my life. Um, okay. He himself has been an entrepreneur. My grandfather, my great grandfather, all, you know, small business owners in different niches. And so I just had a lot of support um, just from those early stages. I did not, not know what the heck I was doing. And so that's what I kind of say when I mean we. Okay. Uh, I want to back it up a bit if, yeah. if, if we can. Like, of all those businesses that you saw and you wanted to get, get into, why why that business specifically? You mentioned that you fell in love with the brand, what they were doing, and was there any close seconds that if it wasn't for Rise Bar, you would have chosen something else? I, I love this question because it, and this is so important for everyone, just kind of figuring out what you're truly passionate about, what drives you. Um, one of my favorite entrepreneurs, Dan Sullivan, um, he, he believes that 
you know, an entrepreneur, like you need to be using your unique ability, something that you love, that you're continually passionate about, and that you never burn out, that you should be using that 90% of the time. So I kind of went back to the drawing board throughout this search process and realized that, you know, I've always been into health and fitness, like ever since I was a freshman in high school and my dad wanted me to put on 20 pounds before I played football. Mm -hmm. And that's where I fell in love with fitness and nutrition. And I realized like I've always worked out, I've always stayed up to speed, but the industries I was involved in didn't really revolve around that passion. And so I, I realized there was there had to be something within this overarching health and fitness category that I could just get so pumped on and excited about. And I saw the nutrition bars, like throughout the whole recession, it was one of the few little niches that kept growing. And it kind of makes sense. Everyone, we're busier than ever. We're always on the go. You need something that's really portable and clean that tastes good. And nutrition bars are one of the few foods that you can do that with. Um, and so for me, I, I did research on that, beverages, supplements, and I saw that, wow, bars, I, we could really stand a good chance of creating like this really good brand that would stand differentiated. And as long as you had the marketing muscle to, and, and, the, and the right kind of strategy to get it to grow, you could stand a chance to have, you know, 10, 20, $30 million business. That's awesome. That's so, cool. As far as like, does, does Rise Bar require like FDA approval and like red tape like that? It, I mean, FDA is so murky. Uh, what you, there's a lot of things, I'm sure, like uh, Jason from uh, Playground could attest to this. But there's a lot of things like that go on within the kitchen and the food industry that you probably don't want to know about. It is so ill. I would say 80 to 85% of the snacks that you eat, you don't want to know what kind of conditions they're made. The FDA is very, very loose about different types of food products and requirements, especially in packaged foods. Um, for us, we do get FDA certified. They come into our facility uh, at least once a year. It's always unannounced, so we kind of always have to keep it an A game. But um, the, that being said, our previous facility, which I mentioned, was kind of like a cockroach and just really greasy and nasty. They, they never had an issue with that. And in fact, they passed um, a Costco silica inspection with like 95%. What? So oh, there's just fuck. a lot that, yeah, you guys don't want to know about the food industry. <laughs> Where are you located now? Uh, we're down the street. We're about five minutes away in Irvine. Okay. Yeah. So how many employees do you have right now? Oh, we're up to about 25. Wow. So we have a good team and, and we're still like on a you know head per revenue count or revenue per head. Uh, we're still doing really well and we like to, always, I always want to be like lean and mean. I never want to feel too bloated or too mm -hmm. skinny. So where's the distribution for Rise Bar right now? Our biggest customer is Whole Foods. Uh, we do really well there. We're in about five of the 11 regions and then Amazon.com, um, a huge customer for us and then Sprouts. Those are kind of the big local and national accounts. Whole Foods is kind of big. How'd you get involved with that? Like starting from like nothing pretty much. And I mean, you bought this other place that had no traction. They were going down the drain to go into something Whole Foods. It, it, it's the hardest thing in the world. Uh, kind of getting in, you have to do it region by region basis. Um, as I mentioned, there's 11 regions. So we, we hired kind of this sales broker to help us get in, get some of these meetings, um, which was, which was awesome. They helped us. And I always said like, as long as I can just get into kind of one region or one good account, I can handle the rest. So I always, I always wanted to protect my confidence, but I just needed that kind of one, you know, cornerstone account. That, that last, that last domino, the first domino, whatever it's called. Yeah, huge. Yep. So, are you in any gyms or anything? Uh, I think that's a niche we're trying to pursue a lot more. Um, one of the things I've discovered is, I, as an entrepreneur, and I'm sure you guys relate to this, is we're always trying to move 100 miles an hour in 20 different directions. Right. So we're just hungry and hungry. I think um, one of my themes for this year is how do we focus more? And previously, like we had tried to get into different gyms and you know outdoor retail accounts, and a lot of the time the strategy is to expand as much as possible, and you kind of you do it at such a breakneck speed that you realize the rest of the team and your your, your whole workflow can't really keep up. And so I think for us, I would love to get into more gyms. I would love to get into kind of like, you know, the equinoxes of the world and, and, and 24 hour and different fitness distributors. Um, but we still have so much work to do to kind of build a brand with our core consumers, which is that Whole Foods, kind of the affluent active person in their 30s and 40s who, you know, they're too busy to eat on the go, they, but they want a really healthy, clean snack. When you guys first started, did you guys do anything like was, that was direct to consumer where you didn't rely on distribution? Um, no, I mean, we, our website at the time uh, was just, it was junk. I mean, it was really bad. And even now you can see like we've done, we've done huge strides and our brand manager, Cameron, who's probably listening, uh, she did a killer job with kind of help redesigning our whole site. And that's where actually we're going to be placing a lot of emphasis now this year. I've seen some other brands just blow up online, you know, through social media and do such a good job on the e-com side. And you know, it almost creates like this whoosh effect. Everyone hears about you in this concentrated format. So by the time you hit retail and big box, like you just, you fly off the shelf. Would you say most of your business is, d comes from online or comes from the stores? Um, about uh, two-thirds of it comes from stores, um, so the other third is, is online. And what about, like, there's so many different bars out there that 
do you know specifically who your competition is like or is it basically just you against the world yeah i think you know, i get asked that pretty frequently and i would say like there, there are a couple bars who just do an incredible job with their branding their marketing you know quest bar is just they've done a killer job like kind of branding marketing 101 you know my hat's off to them growing from basically you know zero to over 100 million in like five years like a tech company wow. um and so are they competitive yeah in that respect you know they're a high protein bar um, and, and they kind of play in, in some of the similar niches. But for us, you know, we're, we're a little bit smaller. So I always say, like, how can we be best in class? Um, I don't know if you read Good to Great, but one of the things is, like, well, you know, what is kind of, what is that hedgehog? What is that sandbox that we like to play in? And so I think we're trying to discover, you know, what is that we can be world class at better than anyone else and continue to execute on that. So that's interesting. Like, you mentioned Quest, and there's obviously, like, Cliff. And, yeah, um, oh, yeah. Um, actually, right when we started this interview, I saw I got an email from EXO. Have you? Have you? Yeah, the cricket bar, right? The cricket bar, yeah. Yeah. Uh, man, they, those those taste awful. Um, <laughs> and I got them because Tim Ferriss made such a big plug yeah. for him. And then um, anyway, I, I'll never get those again. But then the other side of the spectrum, there's some that just taste like Snicker bars, and I'm just like, yeah, this can't. I got a cavity just now. You know? <laughs> yeah. So I guess at some point, like, um, it's heavily advertised, you know, that it's gluten free, and I, we'll get into all that stuff, but. Um, I would imagine that a lot of bars on the market have similar, you know, characteristics. So at what point is it no longer about quality? Like where you, you can't say our bar is better. It's more of like, we just need to market better or we need to find a niche demo that we're going after or whatever, because we're not going to beat on quality alone, you know, at least not to that point. Like, is your product a hundred percent better than the next bar? Or is it just like, eh, to the average consumer, they're all going to be roughly the same. We just need to be cooler than the other, or we need to be in the faces of the others. You know what I mean? Yeah. Was it like focused group, a focus group you guys are going after? Yeah. I mean, great question. I think that's, as I look and study some of the best brands in our industry, the guys who like go to zero to a billion, I, you know, they all start with a good product, but man, they market the shit out of it. They do such a good job with their branding and building the community um, and, and through spending a ton of money on the marketing muscle. And a lot of consumers, they feel like, you know, th this seems like a cool product and they're, they're actually very forgiving. If the product doesn't have like the best ingredients in the world, it's amazing how many people are willing to stay on the bandwagon. And so I think I've struggled with that. Like, I, I don't ever want to sell out and compromise our ingredients. You know, we almonds are incredibly expensive. Whey isolate's one of the most expensive uh, protein powders you can find and the highest quality, uh, the most bioavailable. And so I never really want to compromise on that. And I always want to make sure it's five ingredients or less for all of our products. And I think that's how we're going to continue to stand out, especially as we see a lot of other brands, you know, for lack of a better word, sell out or just really go marketing heavy. Um, that's always got to be the cornerstone of what we do, like the best ingredients for your body. So I have a question, a, a stupid question, maybe, but um, you've got 25 employees. Um, once a product like this is created, what is what? Where is the time being spent? Is it like let's find? Is the is most of the time being spent on marketing it more, or you know, redeveloping a new product, or you know, expanding? Like, what are 25 people doing? Because the way I see it from like my perspective, because I don't know anything about this, is like got the ingredients, got the recipe, we know how to make it, let's keep making them. Like, what is that, where's the time spent? I, I definitely want to ask you guys the same question. This is just one, one entrepreneur to another. I yeah. think that's the biggest thing. How do you allocate your time? I would say for us, right now we're, um, what I've noticed about our business is we'll have a killer kick-ass year and then the next year we're a little flat. We kind of, we've had to turn a few people over. Then we have, we, we relay the foundation, kick ass, relay the foundation. And so I'm, I'm kind like of tired. Like sprints. Yeah, and I'm, but I'm a little tired of kind of the start stop. So for me, it's uh, right now, I, I made the commitment to hire like a really solid executive team. Um, these guys are up and running, they're kicking ass, and it's the best decision I ever made because now I can spend a lot more of my time to answer your question on the strategy. And so with my executive team, it's like, what is our vision? What is our direction? How can we stay one to two steps ahead? Whereas the rest of the team, you know, how do they how do they execute, but also take that time to also see what the vision of the company is in the big picture? I think before we've been so been so buried in like 80 to 85 percent execution as opposed to at the higher level like spending 75 percent of our time on strategy right. so has it been easier for you to delegate some of the responsibilities to look after the sick baby or um, oh, are you I, still I, fingers yeah. in all, all pieces of the pie or? as much as i would love to say i'm very hands-off i think my, my team would tell you like i i just I, I don't really let up and for me to take a step back is it's not necessarily my nature, but I, I think in order for us to grow and for order kind of to have this this baby in this company mature, 
I need everyone else making 90% of the decisions. And, and my goal within the next 12 months, and this maybe I'm not phrasing it correctly, but I want to be the least important person at that company, meaning everyone there is, can do their job infinitely better than I can. And so for me, I continue to provide the vision, but knowing that these guys are just knocking it out of the park. Just as passionate about it as you are. And they don't get their hands no, held or anything like that. No hierarchy. Because that's kind of that where I was going to go with my next question. You know, you have this book, The 4-Hour Workweek, that sparks the initial, like, don't want to be an employee anymore i want to be a business owner and not only just any business owner but like one that that strides with like efficiency so you've got that tim ferris side and then there's like the gary vaynerchuk side which is like for him he's like dude i work 18 hours a day every day like that's just it i'm always on the grind you know so which side of that are you on like are you it almost sounds like the four hour work week sparked you to be an entrepreneur, but then you ended up realizing because how much you loved it that you actually never left, you know, like to do the Tim Ferriss stuff. It's like him and the Athletic Greens or the first um, pill he had. What is it? The smart thing? Tim Ferriss? Yeah. Yeah. So, they, well, like that's the whole thing that sparked the book, right? Is you have mm-hmm. him working like that fitness uh, company <coughs> or whatever it was and, and he's working like crazy. The difference is it sounds like that company was successful, but he didn't necessarily have a passion for it. It was just like, this is what you do to be successful. Um, I can understand where you would voluntarily choose to put your time into a business, not because the company necessarily requires it, but it's more of like that's where you feel comfortable. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, is that more your style or do you want to get to the point where you do work three to four hours a day, you know? Yeah, I, th- I think for me it's in, in- – you know, Tim grind. Tim still grinds as much as he says. Mm-hmm. He barely works. The dude works well over fifty hours a week, for sure. Um, and that's I, I think. But what he's about is like it's, it's a different way to think. How to better manage your time and energy, different productivity hacks. And so I think for me, you know, I, I, I waver somewhere in between. I think eventually, as much as like all of us would love to be able to operate our business from a beach in Hawaii, like I just don't know if that's me, nor would I be fulfilled that way. There's days where I just love to grind, and sometimes you'll put in ten or twelve hours, and it doesn't feel like that. Other days I might only put in a few hours, but it can be so painstaking and draining. So for me, it's like, I think the best balance for me in a perfect world, all things considered, was being able to go into the office or an environment that I love, you know, three or four days a week, four or five hours at a time, and just have these high energy collaborative meetings, provide some inspiration, motivation to the team, build a culture, and then spend the other day or two just, uh, you know, self-improvement. Um, I'm a single guy. Would love to like kind of meet someone over the next year or two. And I've, I've ladies, de- I've, I've devoted so much time to this business for you know the past five years. So for me, I think you know having that. Eventually, I want to get to that place where it's, it's a balance. And so now I couldn't be like Gary <clears throat> grinding 16, 18 hour days consistently. Um, but there's got to be some balance in between for me. What do you think is perhaps the most important piece of advice you've ever received, or maybe that you would pass on to somebody else um, specifically regarding leadership, like? you know, someone who manages a team or starting a company, something that's not about dollars and cents and transactions, but more or less culture and people that are looking to you. I think what I found that I've, that I recently realized and and I've had different people tell me this is everyone follows the pace of the leader. So if I'm at, if I'm running at a frenetic pace, then my team is going to be constantly stressed out. If I'm a little too laid back and relaxed, then my team kind of takes that lead. And so for me, just knowing that your actions are always going to be watched. And so always try to kind of emulate the model of behavior that you want your team to emulate. Um, and I've just noticed that time and time again, just and it kind of ebbs and flows sometimes with my mood and personality. So did you guys grow organically or were you like, like self-funded or did you raise money to do this? I mean, it sounds like if, if you don't mind talking about this in terms of volume revenue wise year over year, like where you guys are at, it sounds like, you know, to have an executive team and 25 employees and, you know, that's not cheap. So either people will raise money to, to fund it um, for you guys. You've been around now for five years or is it like has it has the business grown the business, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I've definitely had to put in um, some capital. Uh, I, I would say that where we are now, I'm kind of tell you the range. We're, we're between five and ten million in revenue, so we, we've we've hit a good spot. And it's that point of inflection where, in order to grow, it, it can't keep coming out of my, my pocketbook. I can't keep you know thinking about friends and family. Uh, I've got to raise some capital to take things to the next level. Um, in terms of like the bootstrapping approach, I think for any business, you, you you learn so much by feeling like, wow, I have to cover payroll this week, and you have to like operate at a very lean and mean strategy. Totally. Um, that way, you know, like once you do get an influx of capital, like you take that time to spend it, 
And I think a lot of, um, there's now more and more companies and we look at tech, they get so much money out of the gate in these sky high valuations that it's, they're in this little bit of a fantasy land and it's no wonder that they run out of money so damn fast. They just didn't know how to, to use the cash in the first place. It's like play money. So I want to back it up a little bit. So when you said, when you guys do, um, when you start grinding like at 85% or whatnot, how do you guys really measure the success or, the, or like the reception you guys get for a given product? What metrics do you guys use other than sales? Uh, that's an amazing question. I think I know that what we need to do a lot more of is uh, consumer research. So like tapping in our top 30 to 40 to 50 people and really making sure before we have a launch, if it's going to be successful, kind of the, the lean startup methodology where you trial and error, trial and error, iterate, iterate, iterate. I think for us, um, the, uh, a success metric, one thing that we really use um, besides like the whole like operational KPI stuff, um, what we're doing a lot more of now, I would say, it's not just so much like uh, doing random consumer surveys, but we also see from a retail perspective, you know, how many new accounts will pick this up right away. And the beauty of having our like our own website, uh, website risebar.com, is we can see like by doing a flash sale, if it hits X amount, like 10,000, 15,000, we could potentially have a winner on our hands. But I think we still need to improve a lot of that. Like how do we gauge, other than just pure revenue, the success of a product? Okay. How many flavors are there right now? We have six uh, high protein bars, and we have a couple like smaller snack items that will be discontinuing because we really eighty twenty principle. Yeah. Our you know six protein bars are eighty percent of our sales. Now, do you foresee more flavors in the future, or how how fast do, do new flavor do you release new flavors? Or it typically takes about six months for a, for a product life cycle. Um, you know, from from womb to tomb till it's ready to launch. I, I do see us moving into different categories. Uh, I think there's a massive opportunity for the same thing, kind of high protein, low ingredient, portable items. Whether that's, you know, a cookie or a brownie or a type of snack. Um, you see a lot of like high protein snacks, but it's either just these dog shit ingredients or just a massive deck full of crap. And I think for us, that's part of our content marketing is as we launch new items, how can we educate the consumer on why these products are better, why a minimal ingredient is better, easier for your stomach to digest, why the quality really matters in terms of the absorption of those ingredients. So that's a, uh, an interesting question, like GMO and soy and gluten. Like, I don't know any of this stuff. Like, why is it bad? Why do you not want those things? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. The reason you probably don't know is just because there's so much misinformation. So you saw like there was a massive proposition in California to eliminate genetically modified foods, um, and in some cases, some there are some decent genetically modified foods in plants that actually could have potentially as good of an amino acid profile. Um, but by and large, a lot of GMO ingredients, uh, peanuts, corn, they're just shoved full of junk. Um, so by and large, we I mean all of our products avoid GMOs. Um, gluten is another kind of hot topic right now. So what ends up happening is for a lot of people, you have a sensitivity to your body. Um, anytime gluten or like wheat, rye, barley, anytime it's absorbed in your bloodstream, oftentimes your stomach, the little, uh, the little lining of your stomach can have a, an adverse reaction. What ends up happening to most people is they don't think they have a reaction, but as long as those little like uh, the cilia on your stomach lining are inflamed, your body has some kind of a reaction. So that's why they call inflammation the silent killer. And supposedly about 70% of people have some type of gluten, uh, gluten reaction. But mo the by and large, most of you guys can't feel it, but you can probably see it in other ways. Like maybe um, you get a little bit of a stuffy nose or you feel a little foggy headed or you have trouble losing weight. And sometimes that's, you know, there, there's certain types of correlations that you can find there okay. with, with regards to a uh, gluten. Interesting. What do you guys got? I have a two part <clears throat> question, Pete. Um, was there a point when after Rise by started initially in 2011 where you thought, oh shit, we might not be able to make this happen? And on the other side, when or has there been a point where you've been like, oh, I, I'm feeling pretty confident that this is gonna this is gonna work? Yeah, I don't know about you guys. It, it happens for me. Um, you know, every gosh, every few months, like you kind of have that oh shit moment for different reasons. A uh, critical employee leaves, or you fail to pick up a new account. Um, you, you just feel like that on the edge of burnout. I think, um, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think for me, I, I love having the underdog mentality. I never want to feel like too big in my britches or, or too cocky. I always want to have this kind of this, this, this humble, quiet confidence and just keep pushing forward. I think it's important to know your boundaries, like kind of when you're getting a little too burnt out and you need a break. But it's very easy to kind of put yourself what I call kind of the gap. Meaning you, as you know, as entrepreneurs, we're always like striving for the ideal, um, the, the perfect this, the perfect that. And we, we don't realize like where we've made so much progress is in fact 
a massive gap from where we were, but we're always, because we're always striving towards the ideal, I think that's why I kind of have some of those oh shit moments and I have to remind myself, you've, you guys have come a long way from you know just a few hundred thousand to you know on pace for um, you know 10 million in the next couple of years. Have there been any unforeseen, um, shoot, what's the word I'm looking for? Unforeseen um, sacrifices that you've had to make? Because you know we all want to you know be an entrepreneur, start our own business. We have this idea of what it's going to be like, but whether it's you know sleep or whether it's your personal life or your fitness routine drops off, what have been like sort of some sacrifices you've had to make that you had no idea you'd have to make? Are you guys all single? Not married, but in a relationship. Okay. I, I asked that because that's been a big thing for me. Um, you see the, how wide our eyes all got when we were all just like this? <laughs> yeah. No, it's because I, you know, I asked because I think for me, like I, a lot of the, in the personal side, it's really hard for a lot of people, a lot of women to understand for me, um, you know, the grind that would take. Sometimes like your business becomes you and having like a really shitty day at work, it's more than just like a kind of a nine to five. You, you really internalize a lot of that. And I think that's been, it's been hard for me because there's times where I need to take a step back and just focus on getting this baby healthy. Everything else is secondary. So I would say that's the main sacrifice for me. It's, it's been, you know, a bit of the personal side, friends and friends and family uh, relationships. And so that's something I'm, you know, hope to work on for the next six to eight months. Yeah, I was going to ask um, when it comes to the grind and all the, all these things, like, I guess a pretty common question is how do you find time to unplug? What do you do? And, and I'm interested in that as well. But I'm really interested in how how do you maintain a level of patience? Like, you know, for me, and I think for a lot of people, especially when there's a lot of writing on it, like it's more emotional and it's more personal when something shakes you, like an employee leaves or you lose an account or anything, you know, for that matter. It's not a day at the office, nine to five, where it's like, that sucks for the company. And even though I'm responsible for the company, it's like, no, this is your company. And there could be things that upset you, anger you, frustrate you, stress you out. Like, what what are some techniques that you found to be helpful to remain patient? Just overall, the, the, the thing that I found the most, and this is probably the second big advice to any kind of an entrepreneur, it's making sure that you always have at least one or two mentors or advisors that you, that you know you can vent to. Um, that's been critical for me. And so I have uh, a couple local entrepreneurial friends, um, you know, even like just casual conversations with guys like Mike Lestrina, who you guys had on, just being able to go to lunch and, and kind of vent about what's going on and having that safe outlet. That's far and away the best thing that I could do because I can, I, I exercise like crazy. I do a ton of CrossFit, but sometimes it does more harm than good. I just grind myself even more. Um, I see you have up there like meditation. I do that a lot. That kind of helps reset me, but there's something to be said for just being able to have that really close friend and confidant who you can just kind of let, I always say like let, let air out of the balloon. Otherwise it'll sooner or later, it's just going to pop. Do you drink alcohol? And if so, how often? Uh, great question. I, Admittedly, when, when things are going a little bit rougher, yeah, when things are going <laughs> a little bit rougher, um, I, I, I mean, I, I kind of indulge on some weekends. Uh, by and large, I'm 90% extremely clean. Um, I typically avoid alcohol entirely during the week, every now and then, um, have a cocktail. But yeah, there's different times where like the business isn't going so well. And I notice like, you know, as a single guy, if you burn the candle at both ends, you're just get sooner or later, you're just that that's going to be it. The reason I ask is because it's such a social norm, even just to have a cocktail after work or a glass of wine with dinner, anything. So I mean, accepted. It's, it's so accepted and it's so it's, it's abnormal. If you don't drink, if you, if you go somewhere and refuse a drink, people are like, yep. why? Yeah. I don't trust the guy who doesn't drink. One so of those true. people. Like, so the reason why I ask that question is because I see a direct correlation in my own productivity um, I'm definitely not the type of person who slows down when I drink or when, if I've been drinking like to the average person or our agency or air clients, no one would have any idea that the productivity has shifted or, or been watered down. But I personally know I, I just feel differently. Like the, the vision is a little more clouded. Like there's a little less clarity. So it's something I always ask like people who are running a business because it is so normal and is it a part of your daily life or weekly life or not it's just something that is always so fascinating to me so so just maybe the, like a weekend regular social drinker yeah regular social drinker but I, I totally hear you it's kind of um, it, for instance uh, two weekends ago a buddy of mine turned 30 had this really fun blowout and I notice now that I'm 33 like just me having more than like let's say three or four drinks 
I, I can feel it for almost two days later. It's like a two-day hangover. It's yeah. Sunday, you feel really sluggish. You don't sleep all Sunday night. Monday, you're still kind of feeling it. So it's to me, it, 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 I have to kind of pick and choose those battles. And if I'm if I'm kind of the weird dorky guy that has to like drive friends or say no, I just know for me as an entrepreneur, like come Monday morning, like I've got to be firing on all cylinders. I love that shit. Um, um, and you, you have a healthy diet and you exercise and all that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. What were you asking? I was going to take it back to the six months of traveling. Um, did you like do any journaling or documentation? Because that, that's got to be like one of the weirdest things. Like you said it yourself, you're type A, you can't do it, but you pretty much force yourself. So tell, tell me about the process you went. I mean, you fought, probably fought with yourself. I, you know, tr- truth be told, I, I had like what any 27 year old guy would do. I, I traveled to be able to like be social, have fun with friends. Um, I, w- I was in Brazil for New Year's, which was like one of the highlights of my life. So for me, it was more about like unwinding and just kind of like blowing off a ton of steam, always feeling like in, in the grind of things. Um, and so at the time, I, I didn't really do a whole lot of like journaling or meditation. It was more just, it was totally social. But now like journaling is a massive component of what I do. Morning routine is essential. That's another big piece of advice I have for any kind of entrepreneur. What is your morning routine? Um, first thing I do, I meditate for 10 minutes right upon waking. Uh, do you lay down or do you sit up? I, I sit cross-legged and I have like this little meditation mat. And you, what do you listen to? Um, I basically just listen to my breathing. I do focused. Okay, so no no guided, no music. I've tried guided. Guided is awesome. Uh, mindful is awesome. Um, but for me, I just if I can just focus on my breath, it forces my brain to focus. And you're on the floor? Yep. Okay, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's a critical piece of advice. Even Ray Dalio, the famous hedge fund billionaire, said that's, yeah. that's been his number one game changer is meditation. Did you read Money, Master the Game by Tony Robbins? Oh, so good. So good. Yeah. Okay, go on. Um, so after that, I, uh, I, I always make sure that I take time to journal. Um, you know, this Tim Ferriss approach. There's so much shit that gets clogged in your brain on a daily basis, and it kind of helps get a lot of the gremlins out. So you start the day with kind of this clear slate. Um, so that's always the second thing I do. It's typically about 15 minutes of journaling. Journaling, and that that can just be just chicken scratch, like just completely like stream of consciousness thought, or sometimes it's a little bit more structured, like you know, what are what are the three th- big things I want to accomplish this week? Or okay, so it could be one? anything, any anything. type of written release, anything. Okay. Um, and then after that, I always make sure I do a little bit of reading, uh, 15 minutes, inspirational type stuff, books that you know typically get me going. Mastery by Robert Greene is awesome. That really fucking book is awesome. I just got oh, that no. book as a gift. Yeah, I, Did, I, I like that it's like chapters. You can like like just like you said, like 15 minutes a day, kill one chapter every day. Like, dude, it's flipping awesome. Really good one. Um, the other one I would recommend is The Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino. You writing these down, King? <laughs> of course I am. <laughs> Um, okay, and then so about 15 minutes of reading. So, so far we're into it for about 45 minutes. Yeah, it's typically about 45 minutes. Okay, then um, what? And then I'm kind of, then from that point, like I'm ready to start the day. If I have more time, I'll keep reading. Um, occasionally I'll do like, you know, just like loose calisthenics to get the body warmed up. But typically 30 to 45 minutes is enough to get me going. Do you exercise in the morning? No, I, I would love to. I, I hate saying I'm not a morning person, but I'm just not a big morning guy. I typically go um, t- around 3 or 4 p.m. and then keep working. Got it. Okay. Um, and then for breakfast, do you eat one of these bars? Do you have coffee? What do you do? I, I do something called intermittent fasting. Oh, you yeah. um, we so were I, talking about that. <laughs> so I, I typically skip breakfast. I don't eat until about 11, 11.30. Um, what's another t- I sound like a Tim Ferriss fanboy, but one of his other tips is... You're talking to one right now. No, it's, <laughs> he's got a lot of hacks. One of them is to... I, I've never been a great sleeper. And typically your stomach can wake up before your brain. And if you wait two to three hours after you wake up, then you can sleep in a little bit more sound. And it's, it totally works. Say that one more time. You yeah. can wait. So let's say you're typically used to waking up at 7 a.m. Yeah. But your stomach sometimes wakes up at 4 or 5 a.m. Uh-huh. So a lot before you. And if you have trouble sleeping, you're, it, you're, you're, able to, you're not able to sustain like a really deep sleep. So for me, if I know I'm going to wake up at 7 a.m., then I, I don't want to eat until closer to 10 a.m. If that Got makes it. sense. Got it. Okay. So it wakes up at nine or eight. So I, so my stomach, uh, if my body wakes up at, at, or my mind is ready to wake up at seven a.m., my stomach won't be hungry. Um, it'll start getting hungry around seven a.m., so to speak. Got it. So, do you feel any performance, like loss in your CrossFit? You know, it's been it's been very hit or miss with a lot of people. For me, I feel a lot better. I, I. There's so many cravings that you have um, throughout the day, and for me, it helps control a lot of those cravings, maintains, you know, kind of a healthy, pretty, or pretty healthy, like blood and lipid level profile. 
um, I haven't noticed any drop off at all from doing the intermittent fasting. It's not for everyone. No numbers. Right. No numbers have dropped. No no clean drops. No, Nothing. No. I, I also follow another program uh, called Renaissance Periodization. Um, and for them, it's like for, now that I have a lot more carbs throughout my day, I actually feel more energized. So I condense all my eating <clears> into like an eight-hour window, and I'm crushing my, my PRs. I'm actually um, at 160 pounds for the first time. I'm typically closer to 170, so although I'm leaner, I feel lighter, more svelte, uh, sleeping better just it's overall. Awesome. It's been a good change for me. That's weird. How much are you eating normally? Uh, four meals a day. Four meals a day? Four meals a day, sometimes even, like a snack. Even included with intermittent fasting? Yep. What do your meals look like? Are you on paleo? Um, I'm about, I would say like 90% paleo. I eat you know, sweet potatoes. I'll occasionally have rice. Not the best grain in the world, but it works. Um, but primarily sweet potatoes, yams. Those are kind of my, my go-tos. Um, squash and oatmeal. Those are my big starchy carbs. Shit. And what do you usually have the oatmeal with? Um, I just, just plain, like I, nothing really. I, sometimes I'll put like a few berries in it occasionally. But for me, like, I was so anti-carb for so long as a lot of people are, and it's just kind of this whole misinformation thing. And everyone's body's different, you know, like, um, let's say a, a 70-year-old grandmother, uh, a 40-year-old kind of Asian-American male, and then a young 20-year-old Caucasian, like, they might all have different ways they metabolize food. Sure. And it's just the whole thing, it, it goes back to entrepreneurship. It's all, all of life, I can realize it. so much of it is trial and error. You're going to mess up here and there, and you start to kind of figure out your stride sooner or later. Um. Okay, I got a couple last last few questions here, and we'll wrap up. Um, do you guys have anything? No, Kane. No, I pretty much got it all. So, um, you got an entrepreneur who started a business. It's been a few years. He now makes one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, um, take home pay, and he's in his late twenties, early thirties. Let's say, um, what's a piece of advice you give to a new entrepreneur who's seeing success? That's an amazing question. I, I think it's really easy. I mean, you guys know a lot of guys who've like made a lot of money really quickly. Um, so the, the, the conventional wisdom says to be able to kind of, yeah, spend it, have fun, or save it, right, one or the other. I think the biggest piece of advice that I would give to anyone is it's, it's first of all, like I, I do something called like a yearly review. One of my favorite bloggers, James Clear, has this kind of year in review. So I think it's really important to always have that kind of yearly progress that you've made, goals that you have, because it's really easy. Like if you, if you have no compass or radar, that 150 is going to go really, really fast. and You're going to blow it on a lot of things that, that don't mean the most to you in the world. So I right. would say like figure out what it is that you love the most about where you're currently at and you know what's something that you really want to accomplish with that money in the next six months. Like something that uh, of substantive value. It's just so easy. You see it all the time in Orange County, people just like blowing their cash right away. Right. I mean, it's one of the biggest mistakes. That's why I asked the question is that, you know, um, people will go from the employee, you know, make maybe 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars a year and then maybe start their own gig and they get to, you know, uh, a spot that's somewhat comfortable, maybe double it, double their income and it's on their own terms. So that's that's a win. But it's not the end, you know, and but but the way the money's being spent and the decisions that are being made are very young decisions, you know, and they're very impulsive decisions. And so I'm always curious to know, like what other people's take is on that. And then as we close, are there any other books that you are a fanboy That's for? That's what I was going to read. Um, so mentioned, you know, obviously, we're all for our work. Mastery is awesome. Greatest salesman in the world has been huge for me. Um, one of the another big earthquake book, uh, Think and Grow Rich, oh, yeah. which I'm sure we've all Blood read. Holy Hill. Which I, I think that's just incredible for any human being to read. Uh, on the business side, uh, I love um, Good to Great. Jim Collins has a ton of incredible books. And then uh, Stephen Pressfield's one of my favorite authors. It's so a war of art, um, kind of about how we battle the resistance on our daily basis. That's relatively new, like a year and a half ago, huh? Um, Pressfield has been writing. He actually wrote The Legend of Bagger Vance. He wrote... Um, the whole book on Thermopylae, um, Gates of Fire. And so now he's just, for, for any kind of entrepreneur, just human who needs that kick in the ass, very short and sweet books that he has um, that are just, I, I read almost on a quarterly basis. And I have awesome. 20 more that I could recommend, but those are the ones I go to the most. That's awesome. Or, Pete, thank you so much for being with us. Where can people find you? Uh, best place, uh, the easiest, always online, risebar.com, um, amazon.com if you, if you like uh, Amazon Prime. And then locally uh, for people, Whole Foods, Sprouts, uh, Mother's Market, and you'll see us in a lot more places over the next year or so. Are you on Instagram? 
Uh, yeah, Instagram, Facebook, and um, that's a huge part of what we're trying to do to build that community there. Okay, so that's Rise Bar. And uh, Pete, thank you again so much for being yeah, with us. Thanks good. for bringing us these samples. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, fun. thanks. Thanks, buddy. Oh, wait, cue the music. Uh, you, you've got to take a picture, too. Yes. If you would like to be on the Prestige Living Podcast or know someone that would be a great guest, go to www.prestigelivingpodcast.com. We'd love to hear your story. 